everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Tyler Love. On behalf of New America, to the call. Uh, we want to welcome you to tonight's conversation on eSports and the future of entertainment. Tonight's event is being uh, presented by Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership of Slate Magazine, New America, and Arizona State University that looks at emerging technologies and their transformative effects on public policy and society. So it is in that spirit that we're going to have tonight's conversation. A couple of housekeeping things really fast before we get started. We are recording and live streaming tonight's discussion. So uh, please um, tweet and live tweet and make this an interactive discussion. We're going to get to an audience Q&A portion at the end. Uh, so be prepared for questions then. Um, and I think that's it for questions or for uh, housekeeping things. I'm just going to introduce our moderator for tonight. Seth Stevenson is a contributing writer for Slate Magazine and has written for basically every other publication that's out there as well. So I'm going to refrain from listing them all. Um, but thanks again very much for coming, everyone. And I'm turning it over to Seth. OK, thank you. Let's see. Now you're on. Hello? Yes. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we will be talking about eSports. I don't know what everyone's knowledge level is. I am personally terrible at video games. I just don't have the thumbs for it. I never had that. Uh, but I do know that eSports is, is basically competitive video game playing as opposed to mind sports, which is chess or backgammon or go, or like sports, which is basketball or hockey. Um, tonight on our panel, we have uh, at the far end, Victoria Jackson, who's a sports historian and lecturer at Arizona State University, and I have been told is also a former collegiate and pro track and field athlete. So Victoria, if you would like to vault this table or shot put your water glass, go ahead. Uh, here we have Craig Levine, who is CEO of ESL North America. ESL is the world's largest esports company. Um, and operates some of the world's highest profile esports leagues and tournaments. I don't know if you were a collegiate athlete, but if you'd like to shop with your water glass, you can too. <laughs> More like uh, maybe game Counter Strike or something. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then next to me is T.L. Taylor, who is a sociologist and professor of comparative media studies at MIT. She's the author of Raising the Stakes, which is a book about the professionalization of esports. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, my, my first question, so I have heard about um, esports tournaments with millions upon millions of viewers and selling out soccer stadiums in Korea. Can we talk a little bit about the, the size and scope of this business just so we have a sense of how big this market is and how large this world is? Uh, I am very loath to privilege the other male voice on the panel, but I'm going to start with Craig, because he's in the trenches of running a business. Um, Craig, maybe you can start us off talking a little bit about the size of this business. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of new data that's come out over the last two years for the first time. A company called NewZoo's done a couple great reports. Super Data is another one. Um, and I think they sized it up at something about 139 million esports enthusiasts is what they call it. That's global number. Um, so that number represents a certain amount of interest and uh, cadence watching and engaging with esports content. Um, for ourselves, we recently had our, you know, we, we've done the big stadium events and we live stream uh, all the uh, competitions that we do. Uh, our most recent event was a world championship in Poland three weeks ago. We had over 113,000 people live on site. We literally had a sports stadium and an expo hall and created this whole festival. Um, we had about, uh, I think it was about 80 million online live video sessions over the course of the week. So uh, it's a huge market, it's growing. It certainly had started in Asia, had uh, grown into Europe, and uh, certainly even here in the US over the last few years in particular, has really started to take off. And is it fair to, com to compare the sizes to some of these you know, professional, traditional sports leagues? I, I, I've heard that you know, some of these tournaments, the, the finals compared to the ratings of like NBA finals. Is that, is that accurate in your experiences? Yeah, but I think it's a little deceiving. Esports is a broad topic and category, so esports is like sports. So within the sports, we have NBA, NHL, NFL. Within esports, you have it's by game. So every game sort of an independent community of League of Legends or Counter Strike or Dota or Hearthstone. Um, so as an aggregate, uh, certainly the market scales up pretty well against traditional sports. Um, and even within the world, you know, large events. Uh, or even just on a weekly basis, these broadcasts are drawing numbers that are comparable to or exceeding, uh, you know, your 
traditional Tuesday night Knicks game. Um, there might be more people watching a uh, you know, Cloud9 TSM League of Legends match. <laughs> And um, Teal, I think you sort of um, embedded yourself in this world and really dived into it. Um, on the competitor side, you know, what, how, how, do the, how do the lives of these esports athletes compare to a, like a professional athlete that we're, we're familiar with? Are, you know, are, these, are these people getting unionized? What, what, you know, what are their lives like at the top levels? And, what, and, and are, the, are the, the sponsorships and the brands that are involved, are they the kinds of things that we would see in basketball or baseball or hockey? I think at the topmost levels, people who have secured contracts for themselves in competitive gaming, who maybe are living in a gaming house, who are on some kind of circuit and going around the world playing, you're seeing, you know, it would be very familiar to many of you if you follow traditional athletes. I think the thing that's important to remember, though, is even like in traditional sports, and maybe Victoria wants to jump in, is that, you know, you have the topmost layers that are really famous and making big money, but most athletes are sort of daily athletes, not making tons of money, doing something because they really love it. And it's the same in esports. There are tons of people out there who are striving to have a professional career, or striving to kind of improve their skills, but still have day jobs, are trying to get on a circuit. So there's still a pretty significant sort of lower chunk that's not, that doesn't look like the top rock star athlete that we often see. Um, and uh, Victoria, I'll, I'll direct this to you. Um, so when I told some friends I was moderating a panel on esports, some some of them were like, "Oh, really cool." Some of them were like, "That's those aren't sports." Some of them were, were very dubious, um, and you know, this isn't a real sport. Um, I know you studied the history of sports and and, and, and maybe our how how our culture receives sports. Um, how would you um, answer someone who? who who questions whether these are real sports or whether we should consider them the same way we consider traditional sports? Well, I think there are many ways you can answer that question, actually. Um, the, the first way I would answer it is, does it matter? And my response to that would be, well, everything about this looks like sports, except for probably the participants. So from a historical perspective, so the, the fandom looks the same, that the way this is being commercialized, issues of professionalism and amateurism, kind of all of those components of it, the competitiveness, all of that, um, the fact that you know, we, we have these in large sporting stadiums and arenas in that kind of sense as well. But I, I resist because it doesn't look like sports to me for the participants um, because of the kind of historical constructions of modern sport and the uses and the educational value and the people who are speaking about the, the purpose of sport in the late 19th century, um, so in that context. And so um, what I mean by that is enlightenment ideas of sound mind, sound body, and using one's body um, in a way that's positive and progressive, that we can use science to perfect our, our sporting human forms. And so you have educators, it's, it's part of why sports are part of the educational system in the United States as well, um, because there's a belief in the good of using one's body. And, and that using one's body physically also contributes to a healthy mind. And so that, that component in that context is, is what makes me hesitate to call it sport for the participants. Oh, yes. I think it's a really great point to remember these historical and sort of the way it's situated in culture. I think one of the most interesting things that's happening with the professionalization of esports, you would ask me about unions, for example, is we're starting to see unions are, haven't happened. <laughs> they probably aren't going to happen anytime soon, despite I maybe think they should. But we are starting to see top players get much more legal representation. I mean, the number of esports lawyers I know now uh, is dramatic compared to even just a few years ago. And I think, to get to your point, we're starting to hear people grapple with that rhetoric more and more. So the idea that you might have a trainer or you might think about being a healthy athlete as an esports athlete. Uh, for me, what's interesting is it's always been the community is constantly trying to find ways to situate themselves in the culture. And so sometimes that language gets used to make it more legitimate, to make it interpretable to people who don't understand esports at all. So, and to build off that, I mean, I think sort of this new form of entertainment, this new device that didn't exist 200 years ago, like a javelin. Uh, so that people are interacting in new ways, and I think the same sort of skills that you see in 
other sports, call it NASCAR or Formula One, where it's dexterity and decision making, and all these, you know, not you know, strongest, tallest, fastest type person. Um, I think those are shining through with esports. And to TL's point, you're seeing now the top players are having, you know, sports psychiatrists and uh, really. Um, as the stakes get higher, trying to squeeze out whatever competitive advantage you can. So even developing with training sessions, with keeping your body healthy, recognizing that you know drinking nine Red Bulls a day and eating Cheetos on your couch, like stereotypes might be for gamers, isn't really the path to master your craft. So I think that's an evolution that just started to happen now in a pretty nascent kind of industry and a nascent sport. But I think when I think sports, to me, it's about competition. And uh, I think that's something that esports really does embrace, um, you know, through history as well as that, that element of competitiveness. And, and maybe for maybe there are a few people out here who haven't really watched um, competitive esports or seen what it's like. So maybe you guys can explain a little bit what kind of challenges are these esports athletes coming up against? How are they working together? What 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 makes a great esport athlete? And what are these games like? What do they look like? What do they feel like? Yeah, but it's from a fan, uh, you're gonna head scratch, or it's two people sitting at a, for, for either one-on-one -on -one or team-based competitions, five-on-five, five, seven versus seven, whatever that might be, you know, playing against another team connected through their computer or gaming console. Uh, so if you don't know what's going on, it just looks like 10 people playing a video game. Uh, but within, they're connected virtually, and then they're competing against each other. And there's dexterity for in-game movement, there's a lot of strategy and teamwork, for team compositions and for item builds and for uh, team battles and how you work together. So there's a lot of dimensions to it. Just like if you're to start to sketch out the X's and O's of a football play, you know, why does the team hook to the left and how does that create the hole for, you know, the running back to go, you know, 50 yards into the end zone. Um, so I think that's sort of an element that as a player of these games, people start to become more appreciative of the skill that it takes to excel at the highest level. And the, the most famous of these esports athletes, what, what kind of rewards do they get? How famous do they get? And, and, and maybe, um, uh, Victoria, you can address this. Why, why do we venerate athletes at all? And, and um, should, we be, should we be planning to venerate this next generation of, of athletes? That was, that was multiple questions. <laughs> One of them, you first address sort of what happens if you're a, a very top gamer. What kind of rewards you can expect and how famous do you get? Well, depending on the uh, country you live in, you can get very, very famous. Of course, I think a lot of people often look to South Korea as sort of this almost an esports mythical land where the celebrity esports, top esports players have is huge. That's certainly growing, of course, in North America and Europe. Uh, if you go to any of these large tournaments Craig described, you'll see people with a lot of fame and celebrity. And uh, depending on how savvy they are, um, money, you know, uh, if they're cutting sponsorship deals, if they're contracted to a team, if they've accrued a lot of winnings, uh, maybe they have a lucrative Twitch presence <laughs> that, they, that they monetize. Uh, so depending on, you know, their level of success, they can do okay. Um, it's still a very precarious living, I would say, for most folks. Um, it's by no means stabilized or settled, uh, so it can really range. Um, and then Victoria, um, you know, why do we worship these people who throw a ball through a hoop or you know twitch their thumbs on a, on a little gamepad? Why? Do they, why is this such a huge part of our, our culture? Um, well, uh, I would answer that by saying um, Dave Zirin, who's a sports journalist and does just fantastic work as an educator as well. He kind of has this idea that there's two ways to achieve kind of iconic status. The first is the route of Muhammad Ali, and that is becoming a humanitarian and caring about the world outside of sport and using your sport as a mechanism to do good. And the second is to be the richest athlete of all time in the vein of Michael Jordan, who we have these great quotes from him um, in the past where you know he's been asked to endorse candidates um, you know, in his home state of North Carolina, for example, um, when a black Democrat was running against Jesse Helms, uh, he said, Republicans buy sneakers too, right? So, so he represented Nike, right? That, that was one, well, the Jordan brand specifically, which we saw last night in the tournament. And, and so, you know, Zyron likes to pose this question, you know, 
And he uses LeBron James, actually, uh, who's trying to do both. And Zion says, you can't do both. It's one or the other. And so are we drawn to the Ali's? Are we drawn to the Jordans? And um, you know, as a sports historian, I study sport in its proper historical context. I'm drawn to the Ali's. And uh, you know, we can't look at sport in a vacuum. We have to see sport in the broader world in which it exists. So I think that's why we find sports icons so compelling, is it's a way to look at humanity in a different way. I think one of the interesting things uh, that happens around gaming, too, is that for many people, they are not only fans of the eSport, they, they play the games themselves. Um, I can tell you, I go to Red Sox games. I do not play baseball. I have never played baseball. Uh, so I don't have that same affective relationship with the game. And I think this is an interesting kind of moment uh, where people are playing the game, maybe even daily, and often can have aspirational, even if it's like false aspirational, but like being a better player, I play that game in a kind of affective feeling about it. So computer games are interesting that way. I don't know if there's something we can learn from sports uh, history that helps us understand that. Well, I think action sports is actually another space in which we see participant fans where, to, to the point where you'll watch the X Games and then go try to do those tricks once it's done. And you know, the people write about the thousands of kids out on the streets with their skateboards right after an X Games because they're trying to emulate their, their sporting heroes. I think there's an element of accessibility through video games and eSports <clears throat> that's hard with other sports. If you're not a certain height, a certain build, you're probably not going to dunk anything anytime soon. Um, but you know, there's this element of you know, massive participation, a virtual field to play that I think brings a larger community of more evenly matched people together on a more common basis than going to your playground to for a pickup game of basketball. So I think it does have a sense of fulfillment that you can get on any level by sort of having these micro steps of improvement with the hopes of you know being the best of your group, the best of your class, the best of your school, the best of your area, and kind of progress up a little bit uh, quicker that way too. Is, is there a Muhammad Ali of esports yet? Does that exist? Maybe not Muhammad Ali, probably the Michael Jordan. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting actually. I mean, even within esports, Twitch is the, the biggest live streaming platform for it, and a huge part of it actually, and some of the biggest personalities, even if they're not the players, are actually it's, uh, around sort of charities. And um, there's all these different instances where the community crowdfunds and raises literally millions or tens of millions of dollars for these causes. Uh, in a pretty remarkable way. So I think just very endemic to the community aspect of gaming and esports being the centerpiece of that, there is a lot of humanitarian support uh, built into it. And we saw one interesting thing, I think it was sponsored by ESL, was it last year where uh, one of the top esports players came out to encourage people to sign up for Obamacare. So they had part, ESL had sort of done a partnership with the White House to try to get young people to be understanding the process and they used an esports person to do that. I think that was the first time I've ever seen that happen. Yeah, we did it with, uh, his name's In Control, he's a famous StarCraft II player, he'd been in this car accident and so on. And just, it was just all about uh, healthcare uh, uh, awareness basically for uh, the different programs out there. So using that as a platform just to talk to a millennial audience who might not be reached through traditional media. Uh, so we're, we're talking about the esports community here. What can we see about the demographics of that community and, and how it compares to, to traditional sports or to mind sports um, in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity? Um, are, do have any, has any data emerged about what kind of community we're looking at? I would say there's a lot of really bad data out there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think we actually don't have a very good handle yet on how to measure interest, participation, um, audience around esports. Uh, I'm involved with an initiative called anykey.org. Uh, it's a website you can go to. We're very interested in uh, supporting inclusion and diverse uh, participation in esports. It's a partnership with Intel and ESL. And one of the things I certainly see is women have long been a part of gaming culture, and they've even been a part of esports from the very beginning. So, how do we still tackle the challenges that happen? You know, there's still a lot of sexism, sexism in the space, 
racism, homophobia, so really thinking about how to address some of those structural inequities that keep coming up despite numbers of women participating there. And there, you know, in terms of diversity, different scenes are more or less diverse. The fighting game community, for example, it has historically been incredibly racially and ethnically diverse compared to what are traditionally kind of PC-based titles. So it's, there's not one whole take on it. It's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, I, so I personally have played a lot of League of Legends for, I, or I spent a few weeks playing a lot of League of Legends for a story. And I did encounter, um, uh, it was not the most welcoming atmosphere, I would say, <laughs> A, for someone who's a beginner, it, people are not always incredibly warm in the way that they would handle you not playing well. But I also, you know, there were, I heard slurs, um, there was some of that going on, and um, uh, maybe I'll direct this to you, Craig. So, um, as, as a company, how do you go about trying to weed that stuff out or create a more welcoming environment, a friendlier environment, a more egalitarian environment? So I don't think it's specific to gaming or esports. I think it's a culture of the internet, um, of which obviously gaming is, you know, leverages so heavily. So I think it's much more pronounced in there. Um, but I think it's through awareness. It's through initiatives like any key. Uh, there was an instance where uh, another top Counter Strike player made like a, a comment about another player from another team who'd come, uh, who's basically here from the Ukraine and uh, basically was bullying them. So they started, as a result of that, there's actually this big uproar and that player's name is Freakazoi, sort of an anti-bullying campaign. So trying to create awareness around instances of this happening in a high level, and then really trying to lead as in, you know, from a top-down mentality to set the tone for others to follow. But it uh, certainly is a very uh, big problem, uh, or big hurdle, you know, big area to really try to tackle, and it's not anything that's just going to happen in one, two, three, and I don't think there's a quick fix to it. It's just time and a little bit of maturity, to be honest. As you know, we've recently seen the U.S. women's national soccer team um, demand uh, more comparable pay with the men. Um, in, in the world of professional esports athletes, are there top-level female esports athletes? Does that exist? Yeah, there was an example. Um, so the two different divisions for a game called League of Legends, one's called the Championship Series and one's called the Challenger Series. The Challenger Series and uh, a female had qualified up through the Challenger Series and qualified for the Championship Series. And I think she actually stepped down from her team and she didn't want to compete because of some of those pressures. Um, but it was interesting just to see that you can make it up and it doesn't matter man or woman that if you're good enough, there's no reason that these, you know, the whole esports community at the highest level shouldn't be a you know, blended 50-50. Yeah, we're in a really tricky moment right now because we're, you know, we want to increase women's participation in the space and grow it. Uh, there's a lot of structural problems, cultural problems around harassment. So there's often women's tournaments, and that causes a lot of uh, debate and angst in the scene. And I think a lot of us are just trying to figure out how to move the ball forward uh, to get better equity. Um, but there remain really serious problems, and the women's teams don't make as much. Um, so there's still, you know, when it comes to kind of the amount of money earned, it's still a huge struggle. It's a struggle for all these sports teams and certainly when it comes to tournament winnings. Yeah, I mean, even traditional sports, seeing how the WNBA came however many years after the NBA and how does that separation and nurturing a certain gender sector of the sport, how does that impact the growth? I don't know. Well, in women's, women's basketball is a fascinating example of kind of this idea which is false in our society that there's this kind of linear progressive trajectory of women in sport. It's more like a roller coaster, and, and the best way to look at this is women's basketball. So men don't play basketball when the games, uh, sorry if this is too far of a tangent, but I think it's relevant. Um, men don't play basketball when the sport is first invented. It's sissy, it's boring. Men prove their manliness by playing football. It's the end of the 19th century. There's a fear of emasculation in US society, and Theodore Roosevelt embodies this, right? Um, you, you have kind of industrial ideas coming to the creation of all these modern sporting forms. And then you have a Canadian event basketball, and it's not the sport that we think of today. It's slow, and there's not as much physicality, there's not running. So it's a great game for women to play, and they play it in a respectful female way. They stand back and give a respectful distance when they guard. There's 
players who only play offense, players who only play de defense, but women love this because it is a way for them to do something that's liberating. It's like the bicycle. The bicycle is amazing for women in the 19th century. But the rules change. The women start to become more competitive and athletic. Their clothing, um, they, they're playing these long flowing dresses at first, and you know, then bloomers, then shorts. And by the 1930s, men start to play as well. And their uniforms look the exact same. Men and women have the same uniforms by the 30s, the little short shorts <laughs> and the tank tops. But girls' basketball is incredibly more popular than boys in the 1930s. States hold high school championships in basketball, and the girls sell out and the boys don't. And um, there's professional basketball opportunities for women in the 30s and 40s as well. There's the textile mill leagues. So you can be a professional female basketball player in the 1930s and 40s, and that's, in fact, far more popular. There's more opportunities for women than men. But then we have this kind of conservative backlash coming off of World War II. States cut high school tournaments for basketball for girls. And the boys, who had been cheerleaders, girls were not cheerleaders until this time, cheerleading becomes a female pastime. So now we have the boys who play the games and the girls who are supportive on the sidelines. But this is new. This, this, this isn't how it's always been. And so I think um, that kind of longer, and, and my students are always fascinated by this, of course, because they assume, again, that there's this kind of trajectory and, and that women's professional basketball has only started in the last 20 years with the WNBA, and that's actually not true. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought. That's fine. I, can I just, I love this point, because I think it's so uh, important to remember that sports and leisure is so tied up with cultural ideas about identity and gender and sexuality and race and ethnicity, right? And and they they move and flow over time and we see it in esports all the time. We see it in any sport, right? So it's such a fantastic point because it is easy to get very presentist <laughs> and imagine like all this stuff happening in esports has never happened before and there aren't lessons we can learn. So and so it's great to have a historian here because it's a really important part of the the overall esports story. Uh, and Richard, I'm going to put you back on the spot, which I know you, you, you studied um, NCAA athletics and Title IX, and I think esports is just starting to get a foothold in college athletics. Um, have you looked at that at all, or have you thought about how that might play out? Well, speaking to people who have the ability to shape the future of esports, and if they would like to enter college, I would say be innovative and don't fall into the NCAA model. And I see this as someone who studies college sports is a great opportunity to innovate. And um, an idea that a number of people have been discussing is kind of a way to solve the problem of big time college sports is to kind of double down on their educational value and allow student athletes to major in sport. Um, so a woman, oh, okay. a round of applause for that. So there's a, a woman at the University of North Carolina who directs a Center for Research on Intercollegiate Athletics. Her name is Arianne Waite. And she's published on this. She's researching it. She's a policy person unlike me. I can just talk about the past. She's actually studying what will work in the future. Um, but I see esports as a way to, to kind of show us old traditional sports folks how to innovate in this. and, and maybe majoring in gaming and in a liberal arts edu education, you could really do something fantastic with that so that you're not falling into this kind of scholarship model where where eSport athletes have to be amateurs. They, it's educational. And then because you've stripped away the amateur label, they can still, on the weekends, maybe make some money. Kind of like musicians are able to. You can major in music and make some money as a musician on the weekends. So, I actually see this as a great pathway out, and that sports could follow esports in this realm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot that's happening. You're starting to see some universities start to get supportive of it. You see Irvine, I think, in California was the most recent to start to add some. Uh, uh, Roger Morris, I think. Robert Morris. Yeah, Robert Morris. Sorry, uh, has some scholarship programs. Um, I agree, there's a lot that we could, there's a green, green pastures ahead for us to pave. <laughs>
So um, Twitch has been mentioned a few times. Twitch.tv is this um, interactive live streaming site where people play video games and other people can watch them play and interact in chat box and talk to them. Um, it seems like a different kind of celebrity that you get. You know, we don't have NBA players just sort of like shooting practice hoops and, and talk, chatting with fans. Um, are, are, are the celebrities here because of things like Twitch, because of things like live streaming? Are they more accessible? Are there different expectations about how accessible they'll be and how much they need to interact with fans? And this is like real-time interaction. I think it's cultural. It's an on-demand lifestyle that everyone lives now. You're on your phone, you got access to all this information, you're tweeting at each other. So there's just become a much more, I'll actually call it a personal relationship or one-to-one -one relationship instead of just a one-way conversation of publishing something and people just consuming it or it's on TV. So I think Twitch embraces that with an interactive chat panel uh, through the live video session, which is really uh, a different way for now people, fans, to interact with sort of these celebrities. Um, and I think that if people, the technology existed in a way, and even if they just started doing it, right, if Tiger Woods started periscoping or live streaming from Twitch as practice rounds, I think people would be intrigued to watch what that was like. Um, you know, or LeBron or you know, Steph Curry shooting three-pointers, uh, you know, in the Thursday night and an off night. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and I think you'll start to see them even start to follow it to some extent. But the personalities of Twitch are, uh, I think, also what makes it unique. And there's such unique quirks. It's um, just things that people can relate to. I think that's the biggest thing through it. I think uh, when it comes to at least esports individual players, Twitch has two really interesting things happening, or live streaming is. One is it often gives uh, savvy esports players an additional revenue mechanism, which is really important. I mean, a number of years ago, a really top player named Grubby was able to sort of jump off of team contracts because he was able to kind of have this portfolio of revenue generating activities of which Twitch was one. The other thing, though, I do think is fascinating is seeing esports players uh, navigate and try to figure out what is that genre of practice as entertainment. And esports players will regularly also hide strategies <laughs> and not broadcast them as they're going into big tournaments. So sort of that strange balance between broadcasting out mundane practice, making it entertaining, and then figuring out what are the things that I have to actually keep to myself, <laughs> or maybe to a handful of other people. So it's all still kind of under process very much. And to take it even a step further, and go really far down the wormhole here, I think it's interesting because there's actually been a, uh, the game called Counter-Strike in North America. Now a lot of the, play, the top pros are making so much more money live streaming than sponsorship or prize money that they're actually practicing wrong. So they're not having the right type of practice and therefore for months or years are getting destroyed on the international competitive circuit because they were more concerned about being a live Twitch celebrity, making money through that platform versus excelling sort of at their craft. And now you're starting to see the pendulum swing back the other way. These guys are competitors at the heart of it all and just don't like losing. Um, and now saying, okay, well, wait a minute, there's a better way to do this. So uh, it's interesting to see. Uh, I'm going to open up to questions in just a minute, but I want to ask two questions before I do. The first, uh, I want to go back in time, and then I want to go forward. So I'll start with our historian going backwards. So this it feels like something new in the world of sports. Is there anything we can compare this to with, where a new kind of sport emerges or a new kind of cultural recreation emerges like this? Is there anything else we can point to like this? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I kind of mentioned it briefly earlier. I think the best comparison would be um, action sports and um, as kind of innovative new sporting forms, but then also the commercial structure and the potential to create a new professional sporting form. And, and specifically the X Games and ESPN is the driver of that. Um, and then the, the way in which action sport athletes are brand ambassadors and the way that they're promoting a lifestyle more than necessarily um, a, a sport spectatorship so that you know, a fan isn't just going and consuming and sitting passively and the team wins or loses and then that affects their mood. <laughs> it, it's more of a lifestyle thing and a, kind of an artistry as well where an action sport fan is also a participant, um, goes and, and 
there's a lot more going on with action sports than just who wins and loses. There's a creativity in the art form, and I think the, the best example would be um, Tony Hawk performing a 900 for the first time in 1999 in San Francisco, and this was televised on ESPN and ESPN2, and his time was up, but he kept going, he kept attempting it, and he failed 12 times, and ESPN kept the feed going, and on the 13th time, he performed a 900, and that just changed X Games and action sports, and the what spectators were consuming was something very, very different from traditional sporting forms, and I think we see kind of similarities between action sports and esports in that way. I'm curious what the 900 in esports would be. Before we get to that, I'm going to ask you, before I open up to questions, I'll ask you um, to look ahead just a little bit. What's coming next down the pike in the world of esports, and how how big is this going to get, and how quickly is it going to grow? How soon will, will we be watching League of Legends instead of the Super Bowl? <laughs> it's happening for some people already. Um, yeah, I always say, it's incredible to think of it as for 15 years, starting as a player and running LAN parties and all this stuff. And to be honest, it's hard to think that we'd ever be at this point where we are now, where we're literally selling out sports stadiums and there's tens of millions of people tuning in to watch it. So it's pretty incredible just to think how far we've come. But still, I think when you think about all the generational and demographic and just socioeconomic things happening and culture that's changing, there's still, we're at like step three of 10. And I think it's only going to continue to get better. Technology has changed the way people interact with media, the way they talk to other people. Um, and esports is sort of at the centerpiece of all of these different kind of things, or video games are at the centerpiece of all of these different things that are happening, drone racing and virtual reality. Um, and you know, esports is such a broad you know, term. So I think in 10 years or 20 years, it'll look very different probably from what it does today, the same way you describe basketball. And everyone goes, that's not basketball. Uh, but the same type of evolution will continue to happen as technology goes and the com you know, competition embrace of that as the form of entertainment. Uh, I always say I'm a sociologist, not a futurologist. So I'm gonna slightly dodge that question and just say, uh, when, when I finished my book, it, it came out in 2012, but I was done about 2011. And for me, the, the period these last several years have really been the moment of seeing the power and the shifts that are happening because of media and broadcast media. So for me, what I'm most interested in, critically over the next handful of years, is looking at how the media domain, esports as a media property and not just a sports property, is really um, gonna be under some interesting scuffles and tensions and an industrial process so that that's uh, broadcasting fees, rights of publicity for players, you know, who's going to license this stuff, how's it going to go out across the world. For me, there's a lot of really interesting stuff still yet to happen in that space. Um, all right, let's open it up to questions. If there are questions for our panels, I think we're going to use microphones. <laughs> right? Yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks. If I wanted to get a real bird's eye view of what's happening, what's hit now, wow, at maybe one or two sites, like where would you recommend I start? So the easiest two sites I would say is actually just go to esports.yahoo.com or ESPN.com as an esports section as well. That'll probably help give you the most bird's eye perspective on it, I think. We won't send you into the depths of Reddit yet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> where on Reddit? I would assume Reddit has it. Yeah, reddit.com slash esports. Esports. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, question on that last point about fees, broadcasting rights media. Uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, we started, uh, my company started to work around esports is because we got tired of having to battle all the media rights that were so telling of the sp traditional sports world. And recently I heard that uh, Riot Games will start charging broadcasting fees for some of their tournaments. So this is probably going to happen here as well, and probably driven by the big number in the audience that the, 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 these events are, 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 are gathering. So how is that going to change the, the game? How is that going to change the players and, and the culture that has been so strong among gamers to preserve their own their own craft. 
I think it'll be interesting to see. I think from a business perspective, it creates opportunities with diversified revenue streams for uh, more traditional sports league models to start to apply and trickle down and provide a more stable bases of salary and longevity of careers to players. Um, so just as you see in the NBA, right, it's a league owned by the teams and within there there's collective bargaining with players and, you know, unions and so on. Um, so I think, you know, it's good to create value around that media. It'll start to feed the ecosystem, prop it up. Um, you know, on the day-to-day -day culture of right offense is, hey, I want to, I can watch this in a hundred different places. Yeah, it'll probably start to direct them towards, you know, one or two different platforms. So um, we'll see it'll be a change to some extent. But yeah. it's, it's already happened, sorry. Um, you know, our content, ESL, we've been exclusive on Twitch for several years. Um, we now have a semi-exclusive and we're on different platforms, but um, people will find it. I think the question will be if it goes behind a pay gate and starts to become inaccessible. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, so I, I don't know what will happen, but I do think one of the interesting tensions that's always been at work in esports, you should have been around the scene long enough, so you should jump in if you disagree, but is the tension between many people, you know, the esports really comes from a hobbyist, enthusiast, serious leisure sports community. So people feel like they have ownership stakes in esports. And I think we're just at this moment, it's been happening for a decade now, but where, you know, big media industry companies are coming in, uh, it is getting commercialized and commodified and taken up. And I think it is going to be interesting to see how a scene is going to make that shift. It has been for a while, but make that shift from kind of enthusiast roots we own it. How can you say that digital playing field, I don't have a right to be on it, to a more commercialized system? Um, so, and we can see how this, this you know, battles out in different ways globally around the right to sport. I mean, I could try, I'm sure Victoria could give us some really great insight on like, that, you know, is the right to sport a fundamental human right? The UN actually says it is. Um, what does it mean about ownership of digital playing fields? So, the cultural tensions, I think, are lurking there. How it actually gets sorted out will be really interesting. Thank you. Um, this was, I think, mentioned very briefly in passing, but uh, in the last couple of years, there's been, um, I think, a burst of investment and organization in uh, drone racing. And I was wondering if anybody uh, could say any more about how that stands in relation to traditional esports. I was talking about this uh, yesterday with our global CEO, and uh, he goes, we're talking about it, it was, you know, just very rough ideas, he hadn't had any real real personal hypothesis behind it, and he goes, something could crash in real life that's not esports. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, it's an interesting perspective. Um, I, I don't know, I think there are crossovers, right? The same sorts of skills that make you a great drone racer probably carry over certain types of video games and simulators or other titles. So um, it's a, you know, another one of those up and coming that'll be interesting to follow. Uh, hello, my question is more along the lines of esports and its relationship with broadcast television. Uh, you have specific companies like Turner Broadcasting working on esports in America and Sky doing esports tournaments in the UK. I just wanted to know, with uh, streaming platforms like Twitch and Azul and Hitbox sort of driving esports viewership, is broadcast television even needed in the growth of esports? I mean, I think we see it as an opportunity to broaden the base of fans, to create new content for different platforms. So we think the live, or sorry, the, the digital platform live streaming is probably very good for the live competition. We think there is an opportunity to tell a story with different channels that uh, traditionally talk to different demographics of people. I think it'll be interesting to see with E-League from Turner if they could bring the younger demographic that's not there to their medium by also featuring that content. I think that's TBD here in the US. It has worked in other parts of the world. We've seen success. Uh, our world championship in Poland was on I think, six or seven different TV channels uh, and outperformed other content on there. We did something with the CW here in the US with the Mortal Kombat X a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that performed very well, you know, relative to other content in that slot and so on. So uh, it's still new. I think it will have success, but it'll just depend what that content is. I will say ethnographically, this has been one of the biggest shifts I've seen. When I was doing my field work for the book, like 2003, 2010, 
pretty uniformly when I would talk to folks who were trying to build the scene, they would say, if we could just get on television, if we could just get, you know, it was a legitimizing thing, we'll build the audience, and I swear in the last two or three years, more and more I hear, we don't need television. <laughs> we know where our audience is. So I, I mean, I'm really curious to see if they can pull off the transition. There's a lot of mm, finicky, finessey things in esports. <laughs> to quirks. Pull. Yeah, quirks, we'll call it, yeah. So, uh, but that's to me been one of the most interesting sort of just internal stances of a lot of folks I encounter. That's fine when you think about traditional media, they look at, or sorry, esports looks at traditional media, we see it as a way to validate. And I think traditional media, when they see esports, they think of it a way to grow their digital platform. <laughs> so it's this very interesting intersection that's happening, uh, where there's this brief moment of time where I think we both need each other, and where the path goes from there, I think will change. Hi, uh, this is directed to the entire panel. Uh, now, Rick Fox, former NBA star and current owner of Echo Fox, recently made the statement that esports would be bigger than hockey. I'm just curious about your panel's opinion upon that, if that's true, if that will come true, and if so, in what way? I think it was uh, referencing some of that Newzoo data that kind of sized up the markets we referenced earlier. So, um, you know, globally, again, according to this you know, research firm, there'll be more esports enthusiasts than hockey enthusiasts, but um, I think it's still more deeply ingrained in a larger base of generations. But. What do you think? Speaking as, now I'll put my athlete hat on. Um, speaking as a <laughs> former professional collegiate athlete in a dying sport that will never fully die because it's the foundation of all sports, track and field. I mean, it's called athletics everywhere but the United States, right? Um, I mean, well, I'm taking the last question too. Like, TV is a horrible mechanism for like promoting our sport. The, the product of track and field on TV is just, oh, it just hurts my soul. Because it's, it's, it's in many cases done so poorly and the, you know, the narratives aren't there and you know, they cut to the commercial break when a key move is made in the race and they come back and it's the last lap and you, you miss it. Anyway, um, no, I, I think um, we, again, I think traditional sporting forms have a lot to learn from esports and, and you know, TV is one component of that, but you know, you also have athletes like um, Gordon Hayward, the, the Utah Jazz small forward, who's um, written about, you know, I think it was in defensive gaming or something like that, where he plays and he gets it, and you know, this younger generation coming up in the NBA, um, the traditional sports folks have a lot to learn. <laughs> And um, I think it's this youth demographic, plus the global, plus the digital. Hey, um, sorry. Uh, so um, I used to watch a lot of Star Trek, and they had a lot of different personalities in the like athletes. Um, you have some very like talkative and chatty and smack talking players, and then you had like. Is traditionally a lot of the Korean players are very reserved and quiet whenever they ha got handed a microphone, except for uh, a select few. And um, when sponsors also come into play, and some players also have uh, inherit kind of the culture of certain like bad things from the internet, like uh, the sexism and the racism and stuff like that. I'm wondering what can we do possibly to learn from traditional sports of like getting our players to like present themselves in a more media friendly way, I guess? Not not trying to like water them down per se, but just like trying to, you know, make it so like an everyday person sees them playing and doesn't like get offended like because they're starting to say racist things or whatnot. I think it's understanding themselves as a brand and the platform that they have to speak to the audience. And I think, again, even traditional sports athletes with a longer window of time and a broader base of exposure have now really just really become super savvy. Um, and I think uh, it just takes a little bit of education, self-awareness, and some training, probably. Um, and I know that is a process. We work with players on it, and a lot of the, the different publishing partners that we work with uh, more and more are now trying to work with players to kind of educate them uh, on what to do and, and how things will uh, be received well and what they can do without realizing they could damage their brand as well. So 
I think it's a process. I think it's been great too to see, you know, there's a handful of teams who've actually stepped up, spoken out, penalized folks, you know, find them. I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's kind of, they don't make a lot of money to begin with a lot of them, so finding them. Some of them do. Some of them do, some of them do, that's right. So uh, I think that's been terrific too, is when teams actually start stepping up and taking responsibility also in kind of managing the players. So, so I have a question around, uh, sort of to Seth's point around aspirational. Where do you guys see this going as Oculus Rift and HoloLens and Oculus VR get pulled into this space? In terms of, because the ability to game together, right? The sort of chat and interaction, maybe on Twitch, you know, with Oculus Rift, at some point you'll be able to be in the game with the, the professional gamer, possibly walking around and commenting, maybe giving advice, I don't know. We should take it. There's a good article actually just today in Fortune.com, I think, or who was Fortune, about uh, Valve's virtual reality system, the HTC Vive, and esports. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said it's going to start as a spectator element, right, where you're going to be immersed within the universe watching people play, and it'll over time likely evolve. Uh, if developers create a ground up, of that is now the new keyboard and mouse of how you're competing, and it adds a physicality to this virtual world, and it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, and Fortune, you said? Yeah, I think it was Fortune, or I think it was Fortune.com today. Yeah. Eat a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like esports came out of accessibility. Like, you're, especially your point saying that it's, uh, let's see, fighting games are very ethno-diverse. And I, I sort of feel like that would come from the fact that there were always Street Fighter 2 machines in almost every pizzeria in the ghetto. And uh, that sort of competitive nature, it was cheap to get into, it was always available. Unlike traditional, traditional sports, I in South Bronx had no access to hockey at all. When I went to college, I was like, oh, I want to try hockey. Until I saw the equipment prices. And uh, I, I was able to get an Xbox and Halo way easier than it was for me to get a full hockey set. I feel eSports is going to be able to keep things accessible while still trying to push the limits of things. I know mobile gaming is helping that out with like uh, free-to-play MOBAs and whatnot, but where do you see the line between trying to go big but still trying to keep it where the next kid can just learn? I think accessibility is important. I think the diversity of platforms, right? everyone, I don't know the numbers, but a lot of people have smartphones. Um, certainly lining up quarters on the arcade, you know, for 25 cents in the pizzeria was the easiest way. Um, but you know, an Xbox is three or four hundred bucks, which isn't nothing. But more and more, I think just as technology is more pervasive, everyone's got some form of this in it more and more in their households. Uh, so I think it's just technology going and broadening the base and new types of games, you know, coming out that you can play on there. Like Hearthstone is a digital card game that you can play on your phone, on your tablet, on your PC, um, where you don't need a you know two thousand dollar gaming machine to run it like some other titles. Um, to the previous to last point, um, I was I want to point out that it, we keep talking about esports as is the players and the the audience, and um, one thing that it's important to point out is that there are several layers of participation. You have the publisher of the game. And then you have the, the modders, the people that modify the games. And then you have the, the gamers. And then you have the people who watch the gamers. And then you have people who create shows about the gamers. And, and it just keeps building up layer after layer after layer, making a very rich ecosystem where everyone is just adding up a little bit of value throughout the entire chain. And so I think. In, 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 I'm not sure if this is more a question, it's more of a statement. Uh, one of the important parts of contributions of esports is to teach about that internet culture of participation into making the whole ecosystem work. It's not someone put in the show and everyone else sit at home watching TV. We are all in it one way or another, and that's what makes it so rich in many ways. Do you agree? I remember there was a point when I was writing the book where I was debating with myself if I wanted to use the word industry. And I decided to, in part because of the point you're making, which is, there's a, it is exactly that. There's not just players and viewers. There's a tremendous number of third-party organizations and companies and all kinds of things that, that filter in there, and even more now with live streaming. So I think you're absolutely right. OK. 
Okay, I have my microphone back, which I think means that is the end of question time. Thank you all for coming. This was great. Thanks to our panelists. Um, thank you all. And um, I think we're going to mingle. <laughs> so,